visits with strange black-eyed children. That's our subject tonight as we visit with David Weatherly, the author of the book Black-Eyed Children. He's next on Conundrums. This week, we're talking with David Weatherly, the author of Black-Eyed Children. And David, uh, where are you coming to us from this week? Uh, currently from the southwest of Arizona. Southwest of Arizona, out there in the... Are you in the desert? Beautiful desert country, yeah. Man, fantastic. I, I've always wanted to live in the desert. I, I live here in South Mississippi, and so it's always hot, humid, or rainy. <laughs> <laughs> but here it's hot and dry in the summer, so... yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I got to admit also that I'm not very familiar with your book, so I'm going to get you to tell us all about the, the black-eyed children and then some of the other things that, that you've had uh, going on. Uh, you've been doing this for about 35 years, right? Uh, studying paranormal That's phenomena? That's correct. Uh, sort of a parallel track for uh, over 35 years now, studying and investigating paranormal phenomena as well as uh, shamanic traditions from cultures around the world. Mm -hmm. And the two have just sort of melded together for me uh, on a parallel track, and it's, it's worked out very nicely. And when you say shamanic, is that uh, like gurus, like uh, Indian uh, gurus, or how do you study that? Some of that more. I've had a lot of uh, Native teachers from various traditions, uh, Native American teachers, teachers from <clears throat> various traditions in the East, such as Tibet. And uh, basically I go to look at the traditional more magical traditions of the cultures that I explore. Hmm, interesting, interesting. So how did you get involved in, in studying black-eyed children? And what are black-eyed children? Well, two very good questions, and there's not a real short answer. Uh, the black-eyed children phenomena became very well-known in the late 90s, around 2000, when an Internet story was posted by a journalist named Brian Bethel. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman had encountered a pair of black-eyed children in the parking lot uh, when he went to pay a bill. Two seemingly normal children that approached his car, but they began to ask him very strange questions. They wanted to uh, know if he could give them a ride because they had forgotten money for a movie. And he began to grow more and more nervous as he was talking to these children. He realized that the movie they were asking about was already more than half over, so none of it quite added up. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly started to feel very afraid of these children. Mm -hmm. When he suddenly realized that uh, these two boys had completely black eyes, solid black, pupils, glare, everything. And he ended up basically running away from these kids. Mm -hmm. His story was posted on the Internet on some... Uh, uh, discussion boards at the time, and people really responded to it. Other people started posting stories. I got involved with it personally because at the time, this was around 2000, 2001, I was actively exploring all kinds of paranormal phenomena. I had heard about the Black Eyed Children, kind of filed it away because I thought, well, this is, this is pretty strange and it's interesting. It mm -hmm. could be an urban legend. And... It turned out that a couple of years later, I had a gentleman who approached me, and he was uh, one of these guys that was completely skeptic about everything. Um, couldn't leave the topic of the paranormal alone, however. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he would constantly bring up, well, yeah, I don't believe in flying saucers or Bigfoot or any of that BS. And at the same time, he was one of those guys that, having done this for a lot of years, I've encountered these people many times. They constantly voice how skeptical they are, but at the same time, you know they've got some story that's nagging at them. Right. And uh, this gentleman, he was a pretty interesting person. He was well over six feet tall. He was six three, six four, something like that. He was a uh, prison guard. And finally, he caught me one day. He just happened to come into a restaurant. I was having lunch. He asked if he could join me. And we sat down and started talking. And this man finally opened up about his story. 
And it turned out that he had had an encounter with a pair of black-eyed children at his house. Hmm. And it scared the hell out of him. Yeah. Now, I have to emphasize, this man was used to seeing prison brawls. He had seen people shanked. He, he was no slouch. <laughs> yeah. And, and he couldn't get over the fact that a pair of children had terrified him. Wow. And this is a common uh, aspect of encounters with these children. They produce this level of fear in people that is overwhelming. And you were asking about exactly what a black-eyed child is. It, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, a child that has solid black eyes. They try to convince you to let them in your house or to let them in your car. They want to come inside. Hmm. And they end up producing a fight-or-flight response from people. And 99% of the time, is, is absolute fear that the people end up experiencing from encountering these kids. What do these kids look like? I mean, are they just normal kids? They just have black eyes? Do they have special features? Well, there are a few other, uh, there are a few other things that come up in the accounts. Mm-hmm. Usually their skin is described as being either very pale. Some people describe it as being as looking artificial or plasticky, uh, which harkens back to some of the men in black um, accounts. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they usually have, <clears throat> they seem to be pretty much divided between either being dressed very normally and nondescript in hoodies and jeans uh, of very drab colors, grays, browns, or people will describe them as wearing old-fashioned or handmade clothing. Some people will say it looks like Amish clothing. Some people look say it looks like it's uh, hand-stitched or uh, uh, second-hand, so, and, and often ill-fitting. Mm-hmm. So those are some of the common aspects. The other common trait that comes up in these encounters is, as I stated before, these kids want something. They want to be invited inside. So it's unlikely that this is... Um kids just putting on black contacts and pulling a prank on someone there whatever it is it's an elaborate setup right and that's something i explored pretty thoroughly in the book actually a lot of the skeptics will jump up and down and say well you can you can buy solid black contacts and you know this could all be a grand hoax however there are several things to examine when considering that one is you can buy solid black contacts they are not cheap they uh, range somewhere around $300 for a pair. And the other thing that happens with these kids, there are way too many occasions where these children simply disappear very quickly. There's one fascinating encounter that's in the book from a deputy sheriff mm-hmm. who encountered a pair of black-eyed kids on the porch of a house. And this was, oh, 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. Uh, and he had received a call for a house next door, went and took care of the call, came out and was sitting in his car and saw two children standing on uh, the porch of this house. and thought, well, this is crazy. These kids are probably 8, 10 years old. They're standing outside at 3.30 a.m. He approached the kids. They were standing on a porch that was enclosed with a railing, and he tried to talk with them and became convinced that something was seriously wrong with these kids because... They, they, weren't, they were responding very strangely. They kept insisting that they wanted to go inside and that they, they won't let us inside. So he opened the door, knocked on the door to, to rouse the people inside and understand that he had completely blocked these kids from the steps. As long as it took him to knock on that door and turn back around, the kids had vanished. Wow. And he searched the yard, he searched the neighborhood, he couldn't find any sign of these kids. And that's typical of these encounters. These kids show up very suddenly, and they disappear just as suddenly. And is it usually more than one child, or are there reports of just a single child? Sure, there are reports of just a single child. Um, In fact, I just got a report uh, that I posted on my blog yesterday from a woman in Miami, Florida, who had an experience with a black-eyed child. Mm -hmm. And she was living in an executive apartment that a corporation had rented for. Mm -hmm. Went home in the afternoon, took a nap, and uh, fell asleep on her couch, and woke up to a noise, um, sat up on her couch, and realized that someone was knocking on the door. 
And it took her a few minutes to realize, wait, there's nobody knocking on my front door. They're knocking on the glass doors behind me. Hmm. Well, she lived on the third floor. Oh, and wow. <laughs> she turned around, and here's a, uh, a young boy, probably 13 years old, standing at her glass doors, solid black eyes, knocking on the door. And, uh, of course, it scared the hell out of her. She ran in and called the security, and yeah. they got there very quickly claim that they were downstairs in the parking lot anyway. Uh -huh. Hadn't seen this child. There was no sign of this this boy. The security guard, you know, just thought, well, she must be, you know, making this up or something to get attention. But she was absolutely convinced of what she saw. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, very bizarre encounters. And what is, what is you say it's their children, what is the general age of, of do they see like babies or are they... You said 13 years old. Is that average? Yeah, that's about average. The age range seems to be anywhere from uh, about eight years old up into early teens. Mm -hmm. And that's where the greater number of reports fall. Now, I do get some reports of, of older people, even adults that are black-eyed. And often those are very hard to follow up on. And you also get the factor in there, well, this, this may be could be a hoax because you're looking at adults who can afford to go out and spend the kind of money that we're talking about for black contacts and, and things like that. Right. And uh, right. so the, the average range is between 8 and, and 13 years old. Yeah, amazing. What do you think the black-eyed children are? At this point, I believe that they are some type of, for lack of a better word, some type of other dimensional being, possibly mm -hmm. akin to the jinn. Hmm. that are sort of coming into our reality for whatever reason. They seem to feed almost on fear mm -hmm. and high levels of emotional reaction from the people that they encounter. There's mm -hmm. some evidence, too, that they are almost functioning as an omen because a lot of people who encounter these kids have bad luck afterwards, uh, have very strange things happen to them in the days following their encounter. Is there anything that a person should do if they encounter one of these children? Other than not letting them inside? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there some technique or something to make them go away? Uh, not that I'm aware of, other than, than disengaging them. You know, yeah. a good portion of the people who encounter them say that these children are attempting some form of hypnosis or mind control on them. Uh, that's something I didn't mention there. Their speech is always very monotone. Hmm. They don't seem to respond directly to questions. You know, often people try to question or engage these children and say, well, where are your parents? You know, why are you here? And the result is that the children simply repeat the same sentences that they've been stating the entire time. We just want to come inside. It won't take long. Just let us in. Do you? And it's, it's very... Uh, in fact, there was one woman I interviewed who had had experience with hypnosis to stop smoking. And she said that there were a lot of similarities with how she felt when these children started talking to her and how she felt when she was put into a hypnotic state. Wow. Has anyone ever let them in and, and reported what happened afterwards? I have one account that I consider to be very valid. Uh, it's, it's a whole chapter in the book, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And um, it's pretty long, but essentially it was a woman who uh, did have a situation where a child was invited in. It turned out that her son, her 10-year-old son, actually invited this black-eyed child in to their SUV. And what followed was a series of, of very disturbing um, situations for the for the entire family. Hmm. What like what happened? Well, the uh, the husband who ended up driving the SUV was in an accident and totaled the SUV. Uh, this is moments after, maybe an hour after leaving the scene of the encounter. Uh, the young boy who had been in closest proximity to the black eyed child became very ill, and the illness extended for quite some time. In fact, the doctors were very puzzled because 
his symptoms seem to rotate through a, a vast array of, of different things. At first, the doctors thought he had the flu. Then they thought he had something else. He exhibited uh, symptoms that made it appear he had the measles, uh, a stomach virus, just a whole plethora of different symptoms. That, and they didn't know how to treat him because it kept changing. Right. And the family's convinced that basically through a lot of prayer and you know, positive thinking, they were able to, to help save this boy. And he did recover. So there is a good end to the story. Mm-hmm. But the, the mother is convinced that she had an encounter with something very sinister and very evil. And that's another common trait with people who encounter these kids. They often turn towards or turn back towards a religion. A religion. Yes. Do you think? Uh, do you think they're evil? I think they're very sinister. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure how far I would go at this point. I haven't had a personal encounter with one, but I've certainly interviewed a lot of people who have had encounters with them, and I can tell you, it, it causes people to do a lot of soul searching, and it causes people to get on a spiritual path one way or the other. Hmm. Is it possible they could be alien hybrids? Or have you explored that option? That's absolutely. That's one of the things that's explored in the book. And uh, they do share some traits. One of the things that's fascinating about this phenomena is that the black-eyed children actually share traits with a lot of different types of paranormal phenomena. Alien hybrids, uh, they share traits with demonic or undead entities, um, ghosts or spirits. But the hybrid question, that, that's explored pretty thoroughly in the book, and there are a fair number of people who believe that they are alien hybrids, simply because of the black eyes and the pale skin alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very similar to, of course, the grace. Yeah. And uh, people who talk about witnessing alien hybrid children. We're having some uh, audio issues, but we'll continue. Um, if they are alien hybrids, if they are extraterrestrial, what do you think their purpose is? Why, why are they doing this? Well, it could be, uh, you know, some people speculate that this is simply uh, them trying to learn how to acclimate to human behavior mm-hmm. and how to relate to human being, people who are fully human. Uh, certainly, we can go back and look at some of the encounters with the men in black and as you know, those are, are pretty divided. You know, some people believe that men in black are simply government agents. But there are a lot of men in black encounters uh, that the, the MIBs are described as being very alien and uh, very awkward in their use of English language and how they connect or relate to people. So we see some of the same things with the black-eyed children. They seem to have a lot of difficulty in understanding how to ask for what they want and how to relate to people. So it just may be a, uh, it could be a testing ground for them if they are indeed some kind of alien or alien hybrid. Hmm. Uh, Your book, um, how long has it been out? It came out at the beginning of March. Okay. How how far back does the earliest story you have of uh, black-eyed children go? Well, what I did, a lot of people initially thought that the black-eyed children were an urban legend because they were convinced that there weren't any older stories pre-1998 about the black-eyed kids. And when I started exploring this, I was convinced that it was a much older phenomenon. So what I did was I started looking at older tales and realized that it is something that goes back historically. It's just that in older stories, people weren't focused solely on the eyes. Right. For instance, I one of the oldest accounts I believe I collected was from uh, around 1950. And it was a pretty fascinating encounter. It was a, in a rural area. Um, and it was about a young man who was walking home one afternoon. His name was Harold. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically a farming type of community that knew everybody in the neighborhood. And Harold strolling along back to his house and he comes up to the fence line of his house, and here's a young boy leaning against the corner of the fence. Mm. And Harold doesn't recognize him, which is unusual because the whole community knows each other. But he just starts talking to this boy. And in the midst of conversation, he realizes this boy's not saying anything to him, not responding. Mm. And Harold says, are you all right? 
And this boy looks up and says, you take me up to your house. I want to go up to your house. Mm-hmm. And Harold, of course, you know, <laughs> 16 year old boy raised on the farm. He feels a chill go up his, his back and, uh, he looks at this boy and he starts thinking something's not right. And he's, uh, realized suddenly that this boy has solid black eyes uh-huh. and he gets really afraid. He realizes that he needs to run as fast as he can. And has he's, he's only thinking this. He's thinking, how fast can I run up the driveway to my house? And it seems that this boy reads his mind because the response is very quick. Now, don't you run away from me. You're going to walk me up to your house. Wow. And, uh, in, in the family's words, that was all it took for Harold. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he set the record making it up that driveway to the house. <laughs> and, and it sounds yeah. like this one was a, wasn't was asking to come in. He was a little more demanding. He was more demanding. Indeed, he was. And uh, there are a few cases like that. But uh, scared the heck out of Harold. And, of course, he, he ran and told his parents what had happened. And... His father's response, of course, was to grab a shotgun and go marching down the driveway and didn't find anything. Uh, the mother's response was, well, Harold met the devil. <laughs> so I'm taking him down to the preacher. <laughs> and uh, that's how the story was passed down, was that this, this young man had met you know, the old scratch or the devil on, on the road. And... The focus wasn't on the black eyes, but that was definitely a, an aspect of this. There was, there was one other thing, weird thing in that case, too. As Harold was running up his driveway, he said that he heard this sound that sounded like the screech of a bobcat. Hmm. Now, for anybody who's ever heard a bobcat, it's a very eerie sound. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, of course, that just spurred him on to run even faster, I think. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was a very weird aspect to the story. And uh, I guess, you know, they do have hair on the front of your book. It kind of looks like they don't have hair, but they do have hair. They do look like normal children, a little lighter skin, perhaps, but uh, but just odd because of the eyes. So if Right. You, for, the most, for the most part, they appear completely human. Yeah. So if you just ran across one and didn't really pay attention to it, you'd just think it was some kid there, right? That's correct. Yeah. And that actually happens in a lot of the cases, uh start having an exchange with this this child or these children and don't even realize that something is amiss and s- until they start interacting with the child and and hands down people start getting a very odd feeling when they're talking to these children and at some point most of the people do recognize you know the child will look directly at them or uh, you know the person will look closer at the children and realize whoa this child these kids have completely black eyes Mm. are they do you think that they're projecting something that makes a person feel uncomfortable or is it just the oddness of the situation in their eyes you know that's a good question and i actually believe that they are projecting something Mm -hmm. yeah i i do i think they're projecting something energetically now whether that's through their attempted mind control or whether it's something energetic that we don't completely understand, they seem to produce that fight or flight response in people, and it, and it produces a very high level of fear. And at the same time, they seem to thrive on that. So it's almost like they're feeding on it. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting, interesting phenomenon, and uh, apparently it's growing. Right? There's becoming more and more cases of these sightings of black-eyed children. That's correct. It, it looked for a long time like it was a phenomenon that was pretty much confined to the United States. Mm-hmm. But in the last several years, I've gotten more and more reports from around the world, and there do seem to be more encounters all the time. Mm-hmm. Your latest report being that one from Miami. Uh, that's the uh, that's the latest one I posted, and that one um, occurred, I think it was about a year ago that this woman had this experience. But you, they seem to be pretty frequent. Do you have one that's occurred like this year already? Um, let me see. Yeah, I, ha- I have a couple, but they're not really, there's nothing fairly, there's nothing very different about them. They're just kind of mm-hmm. standard, um, you know, I saw one of those black-eyed kids in a parking lot and that type of thing. 
Is, is it fairly widespread or is there concentrated hot spots of reports of these things? It seems to be pretty widespread. I think, uh, you know, I try to track all the different aspects of the types of people this happens to, the, 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 uh, the time of day, the time of year, all these different things. You know, I try to catalog all those sightings to see if there is any kind of rhythm to mm -hmm. it. Uh, I can tell you two things. One is that there have been an awful uh, lot of them in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, as far as regions, if there's not any region that particularly stands out, I've got reports from places as diverse as Toronto, Canada, to uh, South Africa, to Australia, and all over the United States. Mm -hmm. um, most of the encounters do seem to happen in the late afternoon, early evening. Mm -hmm. Is there any... There uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There, there are many more of them at that time of the day. Mm. Okay. Uh, is there? Does it cross ethnic boundaries? Are there white, black-eyed children, black, black-eyed children, uh, Native American black-eyed children, or is, or do they all appear just light-skinned? They all appear um, with unusual skin. Uh, most of the time, it's it's light, very pale in color. There are some cases where their skin is described as being olive. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly like a Mediterranean person. Now, that's kind of interesting, too, because, again, we refer back to some of the Men in Black reports, and that was another thing that was reported in a lot of Men in Black encounters, was that the skin was olive in color. Mm, interesting. And it's a fascinating phenomenon. Of course, your book, The Black-Eyed Children, it's, uh, where is it available now? Is it on Amazon? It's available from leprechaunpress.com. Okay. So if they, someone wanted a copy of your book, they could contact you directly, or they would, uh, would you autograph a book? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But they can go right on leprechaunpress.com and order it directly from there. Uh, there's a PayPal option on there, so if someone wants an autograph copy, they can just put a, uh, something in the notes, and I'll be glad to do that for them. Okay, excellent. And you've done a lot of other research in, in other phenomena such as you do a talk on crystal skulls right that's correct um what is what is your take on crystal skulls what do you think they are and, and their meaning and purpose wow you you ask the questions that uh <laughs> require big answers don't you jay <laughs> gotta keep you talking <laughs> skulls uh <laughs> You know, the crystal skulls are a pretty fascinating topic. I got interested in them in the 1970s. Uh, I had a personal experience where I actually saw one that was uh, in the keeping of a, a shaman in South America back in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I had seen one up close and been able to hold one. And it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. Of course, there's a native legend that says that uh, there are 13 crystal skulls and that they were sent to diverse parts of the world, that when the earth comes to a point where it's in a great crisis, mm -hmm. that the 13 skulls will be gathered back together because they hold information that is vital to the survival of humanity. Hmm. Now, some people scoff at that, and I like to point out that you know a tiny crystal can hold a vast amount of information. Yes. Uh, and is used in a lot of modern technology. So if something the size of a human skull that's a piece of crystal held information, mm -hmm. can you imagine how much it would hold? Exactly. And most of these skulls have been found scattered around the world. Um, where are, how many skulls do we have now that we know of their location and where are they? You know, that's really hotly debated. Uh, there are several here in the United States. Um, of course, the most famous being what's called the Mitchell Hedges skull. Mm -hmm. And that was held by Anna Mitchell Hedges until she passed away a couple years ago mm -hmm. at the ripe old age of like 101, I think, which she accredited to the skull. Uh, so that one's here in the States. There's a couple of others that have been documented as being authentic. Uh, there's one called Shana Ra. 
And there's a really fascinating one that was just found last year, as a matter of fact. And I, I love this story. It was found in uh, Europe by a Swiss journalist hmm. who got busy tracking down uh, artifacts from World War II. And what he found was a little old lady living in a house who had been married to a Nazi SS officer. Hmm. And she was still living in the same place. He had some meetings with her and ended up discovering that on a roof beam in the house, there set a crystal skull that apparently had sat there since 1945 or so. There was some documentation with it that indicated uh, one of the notations said Collection Ron. Now, anybody who's a historian knows that Otto Ron was an SS officer who some people claim was the inspiration for Indiana Jones. He was essentially the head of what loosely interprets as the occult bureau for the Nazis. He went all over the world looking for mystical artifacts for Hitler because that was one of Hitler's fascinations. Mm -hmm. So he collected this skull somewhere in South America, brought it back to Germany. Uh, the story seems to indicate that this particular Nazi SS officer was charged with the keeping of this skull to try to get it back into Berlin mm -hmm. uh, as the Allies were invading, left it at his house, uh, hidden, and it's sat there since that time. And it's, it's an amazing looking skull. It's uh, currently undergoing tests to prove its authenticity. But I, I feel, personally, I feel pretty confident that it's an authentic skull. Is there any indication as to where uh, in South America that he, he found this skull? There's not at this point, no. Mm -hmm. So there's. But, you there's, know, they were meticulous record keepers, so it's, it's very possible that we could find out exactly where that one came from. There may be records in some other vault some other hall or something somewhere else that they kept records that's correct are there records of his expeditions of places that he went to yes there are i'm sorry where yes there are there are records of okay. uh, a lot of the pieces that are on collected and where he where exactly he collected them from all right so a study of that and we may not know until it's been fully you know fully researched but we may be able to find out exactly where he he received that skull. So, in total, how many skulls now do we have? Uh, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from about uh, seven or nine to all thirteen. Hmm. You know, some people were touting that this one that was found in uh, Bavaria last year was the thirteenth skull. And when you look around at the condition uh, that the world is experiencing right now, then this very well may be the crisis point that a lot of native legends were talking about. What is the, uh, the story that when all 13 skulls are brought together, what's going to happen? You know, there's not a lot of details about that. It essentially says that uh, they will be brought together, and once they're together, we'll be able to access the information that's held by the skulls, and that essentially it will guide uh, mankind to a new level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, of course, at this point, it ties in with a lot of the 2012 legends. Right. And, right. you know, the, the idea of a shift in consciousness that we possibly are facing this year. Is there any uh, effort being made to determine who all has the various skulls and to bring them together to one location? Uh, there have been a few efforts. Uh, some of the uh, skulls have been brought together at various times mm -hmm. uh, for gatherings over the last few years. The... Um, the issue is you, you're dealing with a lot of personalities yeah. that uh, all have their own ideas about how things should unfold. So that in itself is a, a challenge, I think, that the skulls face to come together, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting beyond their, their keepers, so to speak. Absolutely. December 21st, 2012, what do you think is going to happen? I think we're all going to still be here to celebrate Christmas. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion about the Mayan calendar and exactly what it means. I, I don't think it's the end of the world. Yeah. I think that we are facing some pretty dramatic turning points mm -hmm. uh, in this world's evolution and that we need to start approaching things at a, a new level of consciousness and with a new level of compassion so that we can 
move forward into 2013. And I really think that, you know, the, the calendar doesn't actually end. There are other calendars that go beyond that with the Mayans. And uh, it's just the way they keep the records. It, it signifies an end of a particular cycle. And uh, I, I don't think we should fear that at this point. I think we should all probably be pretty happy if we get past this cycle that we're in right now and yeah. let it in and go on to something better. Absolutely. In your, uh, in your study of the, the shamans and their teachings, is there anything uh, that's related to this idea that we're in a changing point, uh, a point of time that you know, the Mayans thought it was, time maybe was going to end? But are we in a, I guess what I'm trying to say is a, is a, a shift in something that's happening now? You know, there's a lot of indications in that, uh, in prophecies from around the world, and not just from shamanic cultures, but even if we look at some of the, the prophets like Nostradamus, uh, Edgar Casey, it, it's all about reaching a point where we have to go through a transformation in consciousness in order to survive and to move forward as a people. So I think we're seeing a lot of things come together. It, it's, it's very fascinating because different, uh, depending on your spiritual view, you can find a way to interpret it. You know, conservative Christians can interpret it as the end times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, New Agers can interpret it as, you know, Casey's prophecies of the, the great transformation and the earth changes. And I definitely think that we're seeing that. I mean, the earth is becoming more active. There's massive increases in, in earthquakes and volcanoes. The weather patterns are going crazy. And uh, we are at some kind of an end point, and, and that essentially means that we're approaching the beginning of something new. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? Unfortunately, I do, yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see I more. We're in the midst of that now. Yeah, see more earthquakes, more volcanoes, more tsunamis, possibly mm -hmm. even uh, a nuclear you know, issue again, such as the one in Japan. Um, when do you think we will pass through this and we'll be into a... Uh, uh, going down the downhill slide, so to speak, getting away from it? Well, you know, it's interesting uh, because <clears throat> I think there's some variation in that. Mm -hmm. I like to say that humans have much more say in this matter than we commonly accept we do. Mm -hmm. When en masse we project energy into a particular uh, thing unfolding in a certain way, we help co-create it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of energy and fear being put into uh, 2012. Right. And right. just by default, it may bring us to an end point at the end of this year and, and help us move beyond because I think a lot of people are going to be very surprised, genuinely surprised when we all wake up for, you know, Christmas. <laughs> right. <laughs> just, 22nd. We, we wake up on and, the 22nd and, and nothing happened. And, I, and the yeah. whole world will kind of go, whew, <laughs> like we dodged. <died. Right. laughs> like we dodged a bullet or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, uh, again, you've done so many different things in, in so many different fields. We've, we've talked about the black eyed children and, and crystal skulls. Let's shift over to ufology and uh, anything that you've done in that field. And are you maybe working on a book or something to, in the field of ufology? Um, I'm not working on a, I've got several projects on the table. I don't have, I don't have a ufology book on the table right now that I'm working on now. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I've worked out. I, I tend to, because I've done this for so many years, when I started in the paranormal field, it was interesting because for one thing, People weren't very open-minded about it. We didn't have the, the mass numbers of paranormal shows on television, and people weren't chopping at the bit to tell their ghost story or about or tell about their UFO sighting. So it, it took a lot of work and a lot of effort back then to talk to people and get stories out of them and learn about their encounters. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's the opposite. We're kind of overwhelmed with everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we have to deal with that difference at this point. But because I started in the field so early, I mean, when I used to say paranormal, people assumed that it meant, oh, haunted sites, UFOs, Bigfoot, all of it. Mm -hmm. 
Now you say paranormal, and unfortunately, because of some of the television shows, people think it means strictly ghost, right. and it doesn't. Uh, I, I really believe that we have to look at paranormal events together, collectively, because, you know, there are hot spots around the world uh, that have a large number of different phenomena occurring. And I think we have to look at it holistically so we can be, begin to understand more about what this phenomena actually is and what it means. Mm -hmm. So I tend to look at everything when I look at those things. You know, it's, it's funny because I joke that <clears throat> the uh, I had an incredible report I got from Utah. I went and interviewed these people who had had an encounter with Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And Bigfoot showed up in their backyard. He was walking in their you know, they... And they had all these details about citing this, what they believed was a Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. And there was something about the case that just nagged at me a little bit. I couldn't, I couldn't quite put it together. It was an older couple. They, they came off as being completely honest mm -hmm. and very concerned and just wanting to know that somebody knew that this you know, creature was in their yard. Mm -hmm. Finally, I realized what was missing. And that, after several interviews, I said, I asked this question several times, and I finally got around to it again. I said, I just want to know what it is that caused you to get up at that time of the morning, because you're telling me that you didn't hear this creature making noises until you were up looking out the windows and observing him. So what, what was it that caused you to get up? And they hemmed and hawed, and I said, you know, if it's something personal, if it's something medical, anything else, you know, just, just I can discard this. Well, no, it's not that. And, Finally, after beating around the bush, they got around to tell me, well, we saw lights. Wait a minute, what do you mean you saw lights? Well, we saw lights from overhead and we thought it was an airplane. Mm -hmm. Okay, you thought it was an airplane. Well, what, did you observe an airplane? Well, the long and short is they saw a UFO. <laughs> right. And they were so upset that they had seen a UFO at the same time they saw a Bigfoot. And I said, why didn't you tell me this at the beginning? Well, we didn't want anybody to think we were nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Apparently, seeing so a Bigfoot, you're not nuts. Seeing a UFO, you are, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine to report a Bigfoot, but uh, yeah. if you're talking about UFOs, <laughs> it might be nuts. Maybe they thought it was just but, a little overwhelming to have these two strange things happen you know, together. Right. Yeah. But, um, so, uh, they were up because they, they see a UFO... And then they hear something, they go outside, there's a Bigfoot walking around in their backyard. Um, well, yeah, I guess that, that would, would kind of make you go, hmm, you know. So what became of the case? Uh, where does it stand now? Uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's still open. It's something I'm still looking at. These people, um, the lights had come through their bedroom window is what happened. And the light was so bright that it caused them to get up to see what was happening. They didn't know if it was, you know a helicopter or what was happening. They didn't hear any noise, and they went outside and they observed this craft over their house. And they live in a very rural area. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the midst of this, you know, they saw this creature that was lit up because of the UFO. Right. And it was, you know, standing in their garden and walking through their garden. And, uh, you know, it's something that's still open. I think that there actually are a lot of reports of people seeing a Sasquatch or Bigfoot-like creature around the same time that there are UFO sightings in the area. Now, the issue is, is that MUFON, the largest UFO reporting uh, organization in the country, they don't want to hear about it if you saw Bigfoot at the same time you saw a UFO. Mm -hmm. Over to the Bigfoot organizations, they think you're nuts if you're reporting a UFO at the same time you saw a Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying that Bigfoot's dropping out of UFOs or anything like that. Right. Uh, it, it could be something else entirely, but I, I think we have to look at it. Uh, we have to look at the whole of these reports and begin to understand, well, what is it that's causing this strange phenomenon? It, you know, for all I know, it could be something that's creating some kind of hallucinations. Mm -hmm. uh, or There's any number of possibilities, but until we explore it and really examine and investigate it all, we're not going to have the answers if we're only looking at part of the puzzle. Right. And uh, uh, some people, including me, m most of the time I tend to not want to put all my mysteries in one basket, you know, because then they get all sort of confused together, keep them separated and study one thing along with the other. 
Um, and agreed, you know, the UFO community, they don't want to hear about Bigfoot. Bigfoot community, they don't want to hear about UFOs. Recently in October in uh, Pennsylvania, there was a UFO and Bigfoot conference where the two were brought together, and I thought it went very well. Do you think that we're seeing a, um, a sort of a merging of the paranormal where ghost hunters, Bigfoot hunters, UFO hunters can all kind of come together and agree or agree to disagree? Yeah, I sure do. I, I think uh, just in my time in the field, I, I think I'm seeing it come full circle mm -hmm. because initially in oh, the 70s, you know, people looked at these things more holistically. I think what divided it was a lot of uh, politics. A lot of the organizations that become much larger and more popular and, you know, wanted to create a, a more focused agenda. There's good and bad to that, but I do think that we're reaching a point where people are starting to cooperate more. I'm seeing a lot of uh, crossover with more people that are interested in different aspects of the field and are more willing to listen to different possibilities and theories. Mm -hmm. So uh, I definitely think we're coming back around to that once again, and it's a good thing. I think we'll finally start getting some answers. Do you, um, in mentioning your... Um the shamans again do you practice uh these uh, magic do you practice magic uh, i practice shamanic traditions yes mm -hmm. what would some of the those traditions be what is what are some of the things that you do in your belief well there it, it's quite honestly it's more of a lifestyle you know i, I feel mm -hmm. like i lead a much more spiritual life as opposed to a dogmatic religious life and uh it's a lot of um being aware and conscious, both of the, the people and, and the world around you. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll get us a long way, you know, regardless of... I, I've explored a lot of different religions and spiritual traditions, and I'm pretty open to all of them, to tell you the truth. Right. Okay. 35 years of exploring the paranormal. Uh, you do conferences as well. What's on your calendar for 2012? Where are you going to be? Wow. Let's see. The next thing coming up is um, I'll be at the Alamo UFO Conference at the end of May. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll be speaking about the Crystal Skulls there. Mm -hmm. I'll be at a huge show in Sacramento, California in June. That's uh, the Sacramento UFO Paranormal Summit. And that's just an amazing lineup of people. Uh, Bill Murphy, a friend of mine from Sci-Fi's Fact of Faith, will be there. Uh, Paul Bradford from GHI. Anthony Sanchez, author of UFO Highway. And uh, just a whole a veritable who's who of people in the paranormal and UFO field. That's going to be an amazing conference. Uh, let's see, I'll be at the Wake Up Now conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico later in the year. And a couple of other things that are still haven't verified yet, but I'm pretty much all over the place. And you can find me all over the internet, too. Yeah, and speaking of on the internet, uh, how would someone find your website? What's your web address? Sure, they can check out uh, Two Crows Paranormal at blogspot.com. That's my blog. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's really a good gateway to find me. You can find the links from my Facebook page and my other sites on there. And you can also uh, order the book from leprechaunpress.com. Mm -hmm. Those are the two best sites to find me on the Internet. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and everything else, too. Be so sure. Cool. People are free to, to network with me and friend request me and so forth. Yeah, find David on uh, Facebook. You have a Twitter account as well. I do. It's two crows para. Okay. Yeah. I definitely want to hook up with uh, David, and especially if you want to read the book or you have questions about the book. It's called Black Eyed Children, written by David Weatherly, and uh, available now. You know, so you can purchase it and read it on your Kindle, read it on your portable device, or, or read it in book form. Do you have it in electronic publication form? I, I don't yet. Oh, it's okay. just in uh, traditional paperback form at this point. Okay. All right. Well, maybe that's coming. David, thank you so much for being my guest on Conundrums this week. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. And we will see you next time on Conundrums. Conundrums.